Uh, so good morning, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Martin Brenny jones um, from Catalyst, and I'm, I'm joined by my colleague Sophie Smiles, um, also from Catalyst today. Um, um, we've got uh, quite a lot going on in terms of this whole area of Lean Six Sigma, so what I want to do this morning is to cover a few things. First of all, what is this about this combination of Lean and Six Sigma that uh, is so effective? I'll give you some case studies from particularly focusing on non-manufacturing organisations, which I think will be very relevant to you. Um, but, but also, uh, there's been very interesting developments in terms of the use of the web these days in, in changing the whole way that we're doing uh, delivering training and support and coaching, uh, which Sophie's going to cover. So I'm going to whiz through a few things. Welcome to Catalyst, by the way. Um, and um, here's some pictures. This is my colleague, John Morgan. He's the co-author of the book Lean Six Sigma for Dummies with myself. Um, and that's turned out to be um, very, actually, it's amazingly successful, really, surprisingly so, I think. But it's, um, the whole idea is to demystify the approach of what is Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, so this is actually working in a big financial services center in, the, in, the, in Canary Wharf. And, and actually, that one is, uh, believe it or not, that's me yesterday. Uh, so in answer to the question that Zoe was asking, have you done any of this stuff, this is actually yesterday. Uh, working in France, um, working for a very large global company um, at the moment, and we're, we're doing a sort of world tour, really, introducing them to continuous improvements, both for the management teams uh, at all the different plants and, and also the practitioners. So this is the practitioners' uh, training, very practical stuff as well, it is. Um, so the question is, is any of this um, familiar to you? in so many different organisations, and the reaction is, is usually a kind of something, yeah, maybe. Um, exactly. Um, a lot of frustration. You know, organisations seem to be today, we seem to make things too complicated, don't we? Overly complicated in terms of the way we do stuff. Um, and it's very frustrating for the people who are working in, in, in organisations. And I don't think it really matters which kind of organisation you're, you're talking about. We're working with uh, public sector organisations, uh, uh, some very large public sector organisations, actually, um, and also with um, many, many different sectors in the private sector as well, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or in financial services, uh, telecommunications, uh, or manufacturing. And I put this slide up, and it's quite interesting to see the reaction, because almost always, yes, definitely, we, we, we are not perfect, we've definitely got opportunities for improvement. Um, and the problem is that those organisations who are doing a lot of this, um, truth is that they're the ones who are probably going to most benefit from continuous improvement. Let's just call it continuous improvement, shall we? Continuous improvement, but they're the ones who are going to find it most difficult to do it. And that's because the time that's needed and the commitment that's needed from the organisation is going to have to change the way of thinking. Um, so those organisations who are rushing around fixing today's problems today and all the stuff, and, and you can't ignore that. You know, if you've got problems, you have to sort it. So if you look at what this is all about, it's actually not difficult. When you sit down and examine and read the books and all the rest of it, Lean and Six Sigma, whatever you want to call it, the tools and techniques, they are not actually difficult. What is difficult is finding the time and the space and the commitment and the energy to break away from the way you're working at the moment, if that's how you are working, and to really make a concerted effort to, to make this happen. Clearly, we obviously want to get to um, you know, a much better situation than that. Um, and this is all about customers. It's all about understanding how the work gets done. In other words, the processes or the value stream, again, whatever you want to call it. Um, and actually, the pro processes are absolutely key because that's the way the work is done. You've designed, improved, worked on, you've got your processes under control. And in order to do that, you need some data and measurement as well, so that's key. So I'd like to talk about the principles of Lean Six Sigma, or actually continuous improvement. Uh, because I think these principles underpin everything that we're talking about here today. Um, and it's really important to 
to understand that it's the principles that are going to make this stuff happen. The tools and techniques, yes, okay. But I was in one Japanese company not that long ago. And it's great when you go to some companies that have been doing this for years and years and years, and they talk to the managers, they'll say, do you know, first of all, we're still learning. We're still learning how to do this. Secondly, they'll say that this is 80% about principles and 20% about tools and techniques. And that's a really powerful message. You know, if you're going to get this to work, then it's about creating the environment. It is about leadership and management and culture and support and recognition, all those things. Um, and that's really key, and that's the hard stuff. So the hard stuff is getting this to really work inside organizations. Now, it can be done. I'm going to give you some examples as well as we go through today. Focus on the customer. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that, but it's really understanding what customers want. Not what we think they want, but really getting underneath the surface. So the tools and techniques that we talk about here really help you to do that in a very, very powerful way. Um, translating the voice of the customer into something that is measurable. We can then look at how the work is getting done. And how do we look at how the work is done? The visual side of it, make it visual through different types of process mapping techniques. And there are different tools, as I'm sure you know. Managing and improving and smoothing the process flow is coming from the world of lean. This is about flow, about smoothing the flow, about understanding where the bottlenecks are and removing the constraints so that we can get good flow through. You know, there's no point in Department A working its socks off, working overtime, and passing things over to Department B if Department B just hasn't got the capability to cope with the volume of work that's being pushed through from Department A. We had one example of an organization that was doing this. Department A people thought they were doing a great job, and they were working overtime, and they were doing their objectives. But when you looked at the end-to-end -end process and the overall flow, it was quite clear from the amount of work in progress, if you like, the queue building up, that there was a very big bottleneck, and, and it re required smoothing the flow. Okay, non-value added. What do we mean by non-value added? How would we define a non-value added t task, or t a step in a process? We talk about value add, non-value add. So it's important to have a very clear method of distinguishing what is non-value add from value add. And we say there are three tests, actually. A step in a process, first of all, the customer would be very interested and would almost be willing to pay for that step. Secondly, whatever it is that's going through that process, the thing that is being processed, something's happening to it. It's changing. Something really is happening to it in some way. And thirdly, and by the way, you have to pass all three tests to be declared as a value-adding step. The third one is that the step is being done right the first time. It's not the result of failure that's occurred previously in the process. Now, when you start to look at processes and you start to analyze value-add, non-value-add, you'll find that a very high percentage of steps in your processes are actually not value-adding. You can't get rid of them all, but it gives a great way of looking at waste. So it is about waste, and this is obviously also coming from the world of lean. Now, the next one, managing by fact and reducing variation. This is not coming really from the, the world of lean. This is more from the world of Six Sigma. Of course, Sigma, the Greek word, all about looking at variation, understanding variation, reducing the amount of variation, reducing the defects that are occurring from a customer point of view. Sigma, by the way, is nothing to worry too much about. I wouldn't get too worked up about it. If you don't want to call it that, you don't have to. It's, you know, when I start using words like standard deviation, people tend to run out of the room. But actually, it's important. You know, just looking at the average of a set of numbers, say we've got an average of four days to deliver a, a product to a, or a service to a customer, and our target is maybe 20 days. Now, that might be okay. 10 days, that might be okay. What happens if the spread of the variation is such that if we're only achieving an average of four days and we've got a spread, and actually it's only when you look at the amount of variation in the process and understand the variation. By understanding things like standard deviations, it's not difficult. And using tools like control charts, again, this won't come from the world of purely, very much from the Six Sigma end of the spectrum, is a very, very visual, visual tool. So the two things really fit together very well. So managing by fact is about measurement and understanding variation. The number six is absolutely key. This is involving the people 
in the process. Now, the Japanese say, if you want to get things to happen, if you really want to understand how the work is done, you go to the Gemba. And I completely agree with that. But I think also, it's if you want to get improvement to happen, involve the people who are doing the work. We aren't a traditional consultancy company. We don't come in and do things to people. It's very much about skills transfer. And that's what we get a buzz out of. Um, it's about providing the skills and the capabilities, and actually then, you know, it's like a teacher, you know. We see the results in the results that are achieved by the clients, and that's great. In a sense, if we do our job well, and who sits here as well, and so forth, you know, we're out of work. But, you know, that's what we like. Um, it's actually the catalyst thing. So, involving the people is really key. And finally, number seven, a systematic approach for process improvement. After all, process improvement is itself a process. So our systematic way, we also steal from the world of Six Sigma. And I guess there are probably three ways of improving a process. You could uh, distort the data and kid yourself that you're doing okay. You could distort the process. But of course, what we really want to do is to improve the process. So the define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, and if you want more details of this, we've got some of this on the stand. Um, DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, control, is a really useful way of looking at process improvement. Having decided which projects you're going to select, which initiatives you're going to select, DMAIC, as we call it, is just a great kind of journey, view, step-by-step -step way of getting your thinking, and remember this is about change of thinking, so what happens here? Don't jump straight to the solution. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, if the solution is absolutely obvious, then just go for it. But often it's not. Um, often we think we know what's going on, but it's only when we get into understanding through measurement and analyzing, and this doesn't have to take a long time, sensible use of the techniques, we find, aha, that's interesting. When we really know what's going on, maybe the changes aren't that difficult. So we can save ourselves a huge amount of money by not doing things that we thought we were going to when we started. So DMAIC is a great kind of um, method. Um, my world record for short DMAIC is to do a DMAIC in a day. I don't know about you, Houston. I mean, you've probably done a few of those. Cer certainly your thinking process, that was a, with a group of doctors, by the way, it was really good fun in a surgery. Um, but a bigger project may take a few weeks or a few months. and. Um, the framework will stay the same, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. But the tools and techniques may vary slightly as we get more and more you know, into more complex problem solving. So let's just talk a little bit about one or two of these stages. If we talk about anal an an analysis, root cause analysis in particular, again, we don't really want to just look at the symptoms. We need to get underneath. So this uh, analyze phase is going to help us to <coughs> really get underneath the surface and find out what the root cause of our problems are. And we're going to do that by starting off with all of the usual suspects and maybe doing some process mapping and brainstorming and fish fan diagrams. And then we can start to narrow down, narrow down until we can eliminate all these suspects from our inquiries until we really get to the root of it. And this is, a, this is really powerful stuff. Um, involving, of course, the people in the process because they know what's really going on. Well, but collecting data. So, measure is happening very much in the analyze phase. We're looking at measurement, data analysis, and we're looking at process analysis. It doesn't have to be difficult. Actually, you do need to be a bit of a detective, really, uh, to be honest. And so, I've got my favorite detective here. There he is. Um, and uh, of course, he is a Belgian detective, I think that's right. Uh, we, uh, we also have a Belgian detective working for us. Um, there's Marie Helene. I think she's a bit better looking than uh, you know, our uh, favorite uh, Belgian detective. And uh, she's one of our uh, master black belts from uh, GE, General Electric, uh, where she worked and, and earned her, uh, her, 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 the stars that she got for doing this. So if we go forward into looking at um, the next tool, if you like, is asking the question why five times. I've got an example here, and I hope you haven't seen this one before, because it's quite good fun, actually. This is a, it's a real example as well. You can look it up on the internet if you want. It illustrates beautifully the technique of fine why. So I thought I'd just do one, one tool, if that's OK with you. Is that OK? So the stone on the Jefferson Memorial was deteriorating at a faster rate than the same stone on the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, now, why, why was it happening? Well, actually, they found, after a bit of research, 
that um, the Jefferson was washed more frequently? We're asking this irritating question, why again? So why was that? And if it was a smaller kind of workshop, I'd be asking you to come out with your suggestions about why you think that might happen. Uh, but I'll fire up. Okay, so a bit more investigation. It was determined that birds were defecating on the Jefferson more than on Lincoln. Now, a solution was proposed at this stage, and of course it would be tempting to jump straight to a solution at this stage. Um, why don't we put a net <coughs> over the monument to keep the birds away? But they decided to go a bit deeper. So the question is now, why were there more birds on the Jefferson than on the Lincoln? Again, interesting thought. Get your thinking going about this sort of five whys. They found that there, there was a particular spider on the Jefferson that was not on the Lincoln. The birds, of course, like to eat. It does often come down to food, doesn't it? Um, perhaps not in your processes. The birds like to eat this particular spider. Why? Well, were there more on the Jefferson Memorial? Still on the food theme, oh, by the way, I think we've got a spider here, so there you go. Just sort of uh, yeah, do that again. Quite like that. And um, so it was discovered that there was a parasite on the Jefferson Monument that the spiders liked, which caused the disproportionate number of spiders to grow there. And the parasite, parasite was not on the Lincoln. <laughs> So it's really getting annoying now. It's like the kids, isn't it, saying, why? Uh, it's just this is the way it is. No, 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 why, why? Ah, uh, okay, now we're getting down to the root of it. The parasite liked the type of light bulbs on the Jefferson. The Lincoln employed a different type of light bulb. So what was the solution then, in the end? Exactement. It was to change the light. Now often, when you're working on these projects, you will have a moment of discovery when you're working through Analyze, and you discover things that, because when you start, you're having an open mind. I'm in the defined phase, I know what the problem is, I know what the goal is for my project, but I'm gonna have an open mind about what the solution is, let alone what the causes are of the issue. That's quite difficult, actually, if you think about it. You're saying, we don't know what you're gonna do. You don't know what the solution's gonna be. Yeah, no, I don't know what the solution is going to be. Managers have problems with this, actually, to make. You don't know what it is. Surely, I just want the solution. Look, hang in there. It's going to work. Have faith. So you go through and you collect the data, you process, analyze, and you find sometimes it's like having, if you had a thousand keys sitting behind you, a thousand keys, and you know that one of them is going to unlock <coughs> something, but you don't know which one it is. So you do have to use some tools and techniques to work out work out very quickly, you know, what is really going on. But when you do it, and you unlock it, of course the solution is often very simple, as it is in this case as well. So very interesting to find that uh, things aren't always the way you think they are. Okay, now, the control phase. A few words about the control phase. The control phase is um, something that uh, is actually very, very important using this domain approach. And I would, again, recommend strongly, if you're doing a purely implementation, which tends to be you know, we're looking at as is process, we're doing a value stream map, we're looking at improvement. There isn't so much an analytical work going on, in a sense. And then sometimes it's go do it, and we haven't got that strength of the control phase that, that we do have in the DMAIC approach. So we like to combine lean with DMAIC, and of course that means you get a control phase as well. Now the control phase is important because how many times have you seen improvements take place? That's the situation before the performance is going up. Okay, we've, we've implemented the solution, brilliant, we've done the domain, well we haven't done the domain project, and actually what happens is we forgot to put the controls in place, so six months later it's gone back to how it was. And I've seen that a number of times. I think, you know, yeah, definitely. So uh, the good thing about control is that it does ensure that you have, a, you have to think about what are the controlling factors, what are the, uh, what are the right measurement system, and the control plan you need to have in place. So it fits in really well. So Lean Six Sigma is basically the best of both worlds. It's, we're talking about Lean, uh, which is where we talk about waste and speed and flow, and we're talking about Six Sigma, which is all about uh, defect reduction, customer focus on both of them, variation, and the methodology itself. So that's the, the approach we, we like to, to, uh, to promote, and we're working with a number of different organizations doing that at the moment. 
Project selection is key, and of course, um, you may end up with a whole variety of different types of projects or initiatives or whatever you want to call them. You know, the kind of just do it, get on the Kaizen events approach for rapid improvement, again, using Demaic as well. Small Lean Six Sigma projects, you may have some pretty big ones as well. We would recommend trying to keep these things down as tightly as you can in terms of scope and size. And maybe there are some big projects that need some capital expenditure or an IT uh, change that may, because of some organizations, it can take a lot longer to get to that through. By the way, this approach does work in IT as well. So as I said, Lean Six Sigma for rapid improvement, um, very, very effective way using workshop style, and you know, again, we don't have to be too heavy duty with the tools and techniques here. Quite often it's good to have kind of a defined phase workshop and then maybe a measure phase and then analyze and improve coming together. And then we need to think about the solutions and uh, in, in many of the government sector organizations we're working for, you, you have to go through a defined measure, analyze and into improve. And in the improve phase, you're coming up with the, the recommendations for action and, and you're testing those recommendations. So we're working with one big uh, police force uh, where we've just gone through that whole process of looking at a review of an end-to-end -end process. Um, and uh, actually it links back to some of the stuff that Zoe was talking about, from arrest to judicial outcome and that kind of thing. But the recommendations for change then go up to the more senior management to make a decision about whether they can go forward. So that again helps, because in the improved phase, we've, we've got to the point of we are now recommending the actions and solutions. Strictly speaking, the implementation full-scale doesn't take place until the control phase. Um, so there's a good review point in there as well. Okay, so why, why do it um, is the other piece, right? Why do all this stuff? I mean, a big focus, as you've seen, is, is, on, um, is on waste, it's on variation, it's on time and doing things faster, removing bottlenecks, etc. Being able to predict performance using variation-based measures and, and some, some fairly nice, uh, useful statistics. And we're also um, if you come to the stand, we're also working with a company that's specializing in simulation as well, which is really interesting when you're looking at Q sizes and being able to build discrete models uh, to simulate situations, which is very interesting to predict what performance would be. You know, do I need another doctor or do I need two more nurses or another? What are the options and how would that work in practice? If people are interested in that, come and talk to us because we really uh, like combining that with the whole idea of lean. You know, oh, how well are we meeting customer requirements and, uh, and when to take action and when not to. Uh, so again, these tools are going to help, help you in everyday operational excellence as well. So lots of examples of uh, projects. Um, and I'm, I've got some non-transactional ones, uh, non-manufacturing ones here. Sales order management, customer information records, uh, call centers, a lot of work in call centers. HR, that's an interesting area, looking at uh, time, to, uh, time to recruit, quality of recruitment. Um, um, looking at skills retention. Uh, a lot of finance ones, I'll give you an example in a minute. Marketing, uh, cash collection, finance ones, as I said, sales management, lots of examples. I'm giving you examples here, not just from, from the world of the public sector, but from the other worlds that we're working with as well. And, um, you know, some pretty impressive figures, actually. And one of the other nice things about Lean Six Sigma, because there is a strong focus on measurement, all of the initiatives will have a very clear, you know, benefit measurement that's built into it. Now you can't do that at the beginning, but as you get further around, define, you know, into analyze, improve, certainly improve and control, you can really start to look at, you know, what exactly are these benefits that are coming out. There's one thing that senior executives and finance directors like, it's seeing tangible benefits from these programs. Um, and I think probably that's the reason why this has been so successful in corporations going back to the world of GE, uh, when Jack Welsh uh, started Six Sigma, he was actually quite skeptical about this approach. And it was only after he ran a few you know, pilot pro projects and saw the results that were coming through. In terms of real tangible benefits, he said, let's go for it. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, that, was, uh, that was a few years ago, but then things have moved on. There's more a combination of Lean and Six Sigma and some of the soft skills coming in here as well nowadays. There's an example from financial services. Okay, so um, it's the business area received high volumes of various applications, okay? Um, there was a high backlog of work, okay? So these are the issues. And the time to issue applications was uh, getting longer and customers obviously were unhappy and the staff were unhappy as well. So the approach taken was to adopt the uh, Lean Six Sigma approach, the DMAIC approach, understand the flow of work, 
through. So this is about looking at the process, the way the work is done, um, and look at the concept of level loading. So I talked about uh, removing constraints, uh, bottlenecks, and understanding uh, where those are in, in the process. So the discovery, and it is quite interesting, you start to dis find discovery as you go through these. About half of the workload was chaser requests. Now that is definitely not value adding. Um, only the other half was actual real work. Using a cell-based concept is where people work together on a specific product. Um, it brought together the different teams working together on things. A much better flow of work and it reduced the volume of chaser requests. Chaser requests, you know, people, customers chasing things or whatever, or other departments chase. This is all non-value-added stuff. So it's like the slide I showed you before, you know, with burning up all of the, uh, the dollars or the pound notes. Okay, benefits, I mean, again, tangible, 500,000 in the uh, first six months. And uh, lots of other kind of softer benefits as well in terms of morale, et cetera, et cetera. So the key learning here was, um, don't assume that delays are always caused by the external parties, in this case, county medical experts. <laughs> and the answer was not to throw more people at the, at the problem, because often the, if, you, if you start, you think, oh, actually, what we need, how many times have I heard, what we need are more people, we have more resources. You have got resources, it's just you, you're using them in a way which is uh, probably not very effective, because they're working on non-value-added activities. Another example from the call centre, um, this is um, financial services, the call center. So we've got volumes, fluctuating volumes coming in, very reactive uh, approach being able to try and take to answer these calls. The call center didn't always meet their service level agreements, um, which led to more inquiries, more paperwork, chasing, and all that stuff. So it's back to that picture I showed you before about the hassle and the chaos and all that stuff. Approach taken. Um, Actually, the data collection um, really carried out, so data collection, to really understand what was going on. So the different types, there's segmentation of data here as well, which is something you can do in the analyze space. Discovery, a lot of predictable calls were coming in all the time. So Perita was very helpful in, in determining the biggest types of calls, categorize the calls. Training was modified. Um, a lot of waste calls, uh, could be eliminated, um, and uh, this was really, really good stuff. So speedier training, um, answering the calls much faster, and uh, actually they had some spin-off projects then to look in more detail at, at some of the aspects of waste. So the key learning on this one was the businesses, they need to uh, work better together, um, and really it was just symptomatic of uh, the deeper problems in the processes. It's like looking at process health, really. I quite like the idea of process health, and we do health checks as well across organisations to look at how well their processes are operating. Um, uh, here's another example, this one from the police, is, uh, from the public sector, it's police. And so the issue there was the requirement to improve frontline policing, whilst if, if, it's a classic, isn't it, implementing cost reduction, in other words, doing more for less. Um, so a big team put together, and Houston was very involved in this one, uh, facilitated um, the approach, the Six Sigma, Demaic again, Define the problem, go through that approach. You know, measurement, root cause analysis, a number of work streams then coming out of that to look at a uh, solution. Discovery. What they found was they, they get much clearer understanding of different crime types. Policing locations could be optimized. Uh, the way you have the, the troops operating and the timing as well. Um, and that was approved by the governing bodies. And this is quite a major change, wasn't it? carried out as a result of that. Um, a lot of benefits coming out of that in all sorts of different ways, having the, the police at the right time, the right place to be able to respond faster, uh, less traveling, less transport as well. Key learning, using the disciplined approach, and this is a very new approach for this police force as well, um, and they found it uh, very helpful really as a, as a route map, and they're now implementing uh, the approach more widely across their operations as well. So uh, very interesting, and we're kicking off and doing some work with them just to help kind of inject the, uh, the training and all the rest of it, the skills into that. And actually on that note, I, I think this is the time when I should hand over to Sophie, uh, just to talk a little bit about um, how, how the internet, it's very interesting how the internet is changing the way that um, we can, what organisations, I don't mean catalyst now, but generally. So if you just say a few words about that, and then we'll, we'll close up and we can, we can go. So, Yes, yeah, so I'll be very brief. I think um, you'll agree with me that there's uh, there's so much 
content here. And um, I've only just recently joined Catalyst, although I've known and worked with Catalyst for a number of years. Um, and one thing that I've, I've really seen is so much um, the, the depth and the breadth of the experience and um, really expertise in the business is, is, is really something. So what I want to do now is um, really just talk briefly about doing things differently, actually. Um, one of the first statements I heard in the conference today was about how things are changing uh, in business and um, well, really everywhere. Things are changing all of the time and we need to, uh, in order to survive, to adapt to these changes. Um, so when I'm talking about building capability and we're all talking about you know, developing the skills and capability of people and processes and organisations, and the way in which we do that um, is... It, today very differently to how it's been done traditionally um, and effectively utilising technology and talent uh, is, is one way that I see an opportunity for companies to, to really stay ahead of, um, of these changes. So to give you a little bit of context, a quick um, background, my personal background is not in uh, consulting and training of, of Lean and Six Sigma, although I've been in this, in this space for a number of years. I set up um, a website in 2003 called 16sigma.com. Its purpose was initially really to um, attract candidates for Six Sigma jobs. It had a jobs board on that, um, on that website and it was financed by a recruitment agency. But what I did with that website uh, was develop a community. I, I started to talk to people about, you know, what what they were doing, um, what this thing called Six Sigma was, and try to attract people through content to that website. What I found was that there was a number of people that were going through training, um, being sent on these very long and um, quite intense training courses, and then being chucked back into the businesses to, to make some improvements. And quite frankly, they were very confused and um, quite stressed about the whole situation, many of these, um, these newly trained black belts and, um, and master black belts. So what I did was I organised a number of meetings for these people to come together and to share some of these problems and to talk to each other about how they are overcoming um, some of these challenges. Over the course of five years I ran about 25 uh, user group meetings and they were non-sales um, environments for these people to really talk very honestly about the problems that are facing their organisations. More and more, uh, the things that came out of those conversations were that it was not necessarily about the understanding of the tools that they were being trained in, but it was the way that they were applying them. When did they use a particular tool? How did they deal with the softer issues, um, the, the leadership um, or lack of um, support, how to manage and sustain change was actually what kept coming out of the, the conversations in those meetings. On, off the back of that, and, and really talking about doing things differently, um, I, I was a media sponsor of a number of conferences, and uh, it, it seems a very um, accepted way of, of bringing people together um, in, in terms of listening to a lot of presentations, uh, talking about, um, I guess, really sort of selling, this is, this is how we do things in this business, um, everything's really rosy and uh, the delegates perhaps don't really get the true information until they either you know, go down the pub afterwards or um, in the coffee breaks perhaps talking to each other about um, you know, some of the more tacit information that doesn't get presented. As a, as a media sponsor I had a lot of feedback saying you know, we get more value from, from the meetings you're running than um, in some of the conferences we're going. To. And so, on the back of that, I set up another organisation called I and I. This is a members organisation. Companies came together um, regularly again to share knowledge, to talk to each other about um, particular issues um, that they're facing. And it was called I and I because over that time, you know, things were evolving. The tools and the, and the techniques were evolving. Lean and Six Sigma. Um, were very much a core part of, of the methodologies and, and the things that uh, people were applying. But they were starting to take on new labels in those organisations. So 
the One Six Sigma website was rebranded to improvementinnovation.com for that reason. And just moving forward to 2010, it was no longer you know, as useful to just get together and talk about some of the issues. Um, companies were saying, we really want to actually start working internally to bring different people together. We recognise the importance of um, sharing knowledge and, uh, and getting this peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, we'd like to do this internally and I started to run 360 exchanges to bring different people together from different silos, different departments in, in their businesses. So my background is, is not in the, in the training and the uh, um, delivery of these, these tools and techniques, but in facilitating and creating the right conditions for people to be learning and um, building capability. So that's a, that's a little bit of background. Um, in joining Catalyst um, and talking about really enabling results and seeing the vast body of knowledge that's available here, um, there is so much that uh, so much knowledge to, to be shared and we want to touch as many people within an organisation and really, as Martin said, talk about the principles of, uh, of the change. It's not so much about the, the technical detail, that's, that's not the real um, challenging part. It's, it's getting the mindset change and developing the, the culture. And these are the things that, um, again, have been, have been throughout the conversations, uh, the meetings that have been running over a number of years. How do we develop a sustained, um, continuous improvement culture? How do we apply tools with discernment and effectively manage change? And I came up against also uh, certainly the traditional way of training. Um, I think it's fair to say it's been very purely instructor-led training. So you gather people into a classroom at the same time and you, you listen to the, um, the, the trainer delivering um, a number of, of slides, which, don't get me wrong, there is, a, there is actually uh, much value to be had from uh, interaction and, and the classroom. What I'm not doing here is selling any learning package. Um, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is the point of actually taking a blended approach to learning and, and education. Um, so the, the traditionally it's been very classroom based, but I don't know if you've heard or experienced this yourself, um, going through training, being hit with a number of, you know, a huge amount of information, um, how much of that do you actually use? How much do you actually get to apply and how effective is that um, to, to your business? So I think these are the three things that I, I've been in, in talking to the, the customers um, that, uh, or the people in, in, in conferences like this, uh, the, the challenges really in, in today's environment making it as effective as possible, um, giving only the relevant knowledge um, when, when it's required. Um, obviously cost, uh, the challenges with, um, with cost and time are, are intense and obviously the, the classroom based training can be, um, can be costly in terms of logistics, especially if you have people uh, spread, spread globally for instance. So um, seeing and hearing uh, a great um, trend in increased flexibility, getting, getting the information and the knowledge transfer to be happening uh, on demand, self-paced learning, and providing flexible scheduling, customised content, because the other thing is that in, in organisations um, that I know of, Yes, the, the problems are very, uh, can be very similar across different industries, public and private um, organisations, but um, the cultures are quite different. And if you're going to create the right conditions for people to be really at, at applying these, um, these tools, you need to understand that and create the right conditions for, for learning in that sense. So, there's some of the, the constraints but today we've got all of these, these tools and these opportunities to utilise technology. Um, using a varied approach to, uh, to developing um, and learning and development also means that you can adapt to 
in different, uh, different cultures. To give you an example, um, I mean, Catalysts have actually videoed all of their green belt and black belt training and um, currently making a yellow belt training um, available as well in these very sort of bite-sized chunks, uh, video clips, which are available within a, a website, a, pr a private access website, which is called Business Improvement Zone. And one of the things that um, I'm working on at the moment is how to uh, work with different organisations to, to really develop curriculums using video-based content um, in, in combination with, with all of these other tools. Online assessments, webinars that bring together people working on projects that are perhaps uh, globally dispersed as well using different software tools and simulations, and the community part uh, should not be underestimated as well. Um, these are all virtual communities, but also um, where people can come together physically too. The one-to-one -one coaching, classroom training, the project work, um, where you're utilizing the talents of exceptional teachers and, and trainers is still vitally important. But I think the question I'd like to really put is, you know, how are we really are we using the resources that are available to us in the most effective way? Are the people that have the expertise working in a very interactive, hands-on way to coach and mentor the people that need to be applying these tools in a really effective way? Or are they sharing information that could just as easily be done through a video? Is it being made available in a way where if people are really busy, they don't have to take a week out of their, their day to, to work in a classroom, but can perhaps see this in, a, in their own time, in a self-paced way, uh, to, to learn what they need to learn. So, there's the opportunities. Um, I'm going to hand that back to, to Martin there, um, and say that I haven't gone into too much detail. If you'd like to speak more about the work that we're, we're doing in, in developing this blended and network learning approach, I'm here all day and I'd be really happy to speak to you at the stand.